everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Time Scavenger's first interview. Today, we are talking about ichnology with Dr. Tony Martin. Um, Adrian Lamb and I will be conducting this interview. Tony is a professor at Emory University and an author of popular science books surrounding ichnology, the Georgia coast, and an intersection of the two. Join us as we chat about what ichnology is, how Tony became an author, and there may even be some surprise dancing near the end. So I'm Adrian Lamb um, from Time Scavengers, and I'm here today with Dr. Jennifer Bauer and Dr. Tony Martin, and we're going to be talking to him about ichnology. So hello, Dr. Martin. Hello. <laughs> and I am so happy to be here to talk about ichnology because I consider myself an ichno evangelist and I'm ready to convert everybody to the Church of Ichnology, which has a holy trinity, substrate, anatomy, and behavior. Amen, sisters. I love it. I'm sold. <laughs> so today, let's start off by just talking about for those of those who are listening that are unfamiliar, maybe what is ichnology? Ichnology is the study of traces, tracks, trails, burrows, nests, borings, tooth traces, gnawings, anything that an animal or a plant can leave on a substrate that shows its behavior. And that's really important to the difference between, say, a trace and a drag mark of a stick going along the bottom of a lake. The latter is not a trace because it's not behavior. There has to be behavior. And that's what I really love about technology is that it reflects behavior. You can actually tell what an animal was having for lunch 500 million years ago through technology. That is so cool and very interesting. So <clears throat> I'm a big fan of technology. Um, obviously, I am a big fan of copper lights. I think they're just the coolest things oh, ever. Copper lights are the best. They are so <laughs> cool. So for those that are listening, copper lights are fossil poop. Um, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes, as you well know, Tony. Um, but, you know, we studied copper, a lot of paleontologists study copper lights, but also these other trace fossils um, to get a sense of animal behavior through time. So why is it important that we study this animal behavior in the geologic past? What's great about trace fossils as a way of looking at animal behavior is trace fossils oftentimes are in the same place where the trace maker was living. So this gives us insights not just on the behavior of, say, the plant or animal that was making these traces at that time, but the place. And it tells us how that animal or plant was interacting with its environment. For instance, if an insect walked across a Permian dune 260 million years ago, we can look at that and say, that insect was walking across a dune. We don't just say, yeah, it was an insect and it was walking. We know something about the environment and the context of the environment in which that insect was living. So that gives us a, kind of a snapshot of behavior that was happening in the ancient past related to the bigger picture of how that, how that trace maker fit into its environment. So what is your favorite trace fossil then and why? That's kind of like asking a parent, what's your favorite kid? <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one to narrow down. One I picked out uh, that I always like to point to is a study I'm very proud of published it about 10 years ago in PLOS One, was about a fish trail, where it's a fish that swam along a lake bottom in Wyoming about 50 million years ago. This fish, when it swam along that lake bottom, first of all showed there was enough oxygen at the bottom of that lake for that fish to be there, to be swimming in the first place. But it left fin marks, and the fin marks, I'll try to do it with my hand, the fin marks kind of, made these double sine curves. So those were from the pelvic fins. Then there was the caudal fin. The caudal fin was doing a bigger sine wave. Then it had a smaller anal fin that was on the bottom of the fish that it was leaving a smaller sine wave. In the middle of all of those traces were these little hawk marks made by its mouth. That's when I, I looked at this trace fossil, I think in 2008 was the first time I saw it. 
And I was like, it was feeding. It was feeding along the bottom of the lake. And there was only one fish in this formation, the Green River Formation from Wyoming, that had a mouth that pointed down. And that was Notagonius osculus. So I knew which fish made it, what it was doing, when it was doing it, told me about the lake, like I was saying earlier, you have it in the context of its environment. And using a little bit of math, we were able to figure out how big it was. Because the sine waves told us a little bit, uh, putting it into a little formula about how big it was. This was the one that got away, and it was this big. Wow. <laughs> 50 million years ago. <laughs> that is That's a pretty darn good trace fossil. So yeah, that one's my favorite, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly so, cool. Good. I have kind of a follow-up question. So that one is kind of easier. So we could watch how modern fish behave and make interpretations based on the fossils and kind of match up the different fin types and think about movement. But not all animals have these like modern comparisons. So how do you interpret trace makers when maybe things are a bit murkier. Oh boy, yeah, that's a tough one. So there are ways that we can, we can look at something like a sauropod dinosaur. So sauropod dinosaurs, we don't have anything like that today. The biggest elephants we have today are maybe around seven tons. Some of these sauropod dinosaurs may have been more than 50 tons. So we have no modern analogs for anything like that. In that case, we have to look at, um, do maybe computer modeling or experiments to look at uh, weight loading and other ways that we can mathematically predict, here's what those traces should look like. But then again, we also have the trace fossils themselves. So we have sauropod tracks and we have uh, other traces made by animals that there's no modern analog whatsoever. So there we have to be really good detectives. We have to look at what was left by the animal that was a part of its behavior, but also taking into account that this behavior may be unlike anything we have today. Uh, it's a really tough problem for when we don't have the exact modern analogs, then we have to use something that's mm, close enough. Does that kind of answer your question? It's a, it's a really tough one to answer, especially when we get into really big animals. And I kind of have a follow-up question to that as well. And I don't know if a lot of people listening are aware that when we name these, um, these ichno fossils, we don't name them after the animal, right? And can you just elaborate why that is? And I think you pretty much touched on that, but just to restate it. Yeah, there's a, a little rule in ichnology is that one trace maker can make many traces. Related to that, then you can also have many different trace makers, many different species of trace makers can make very similar looking traces. So if you started naming trace fossils after the trace maker you think made it, hmm, you might be wrong. If you start naming trace fossils also based on, well, I think a variety of different trace makers made it, so I'm gonna put all their names in the name. Mm -mm. That's not gonna work either. So what we try to do with naming trace fossils is base it on consistent form. So if we see a trace fossil that has a form and it occurs in a substrate, such as sand or mud or wood or stone, if it occurs consistently in a particular kind of substrate, then we give it a name that's consistent. One example I can think of, for instance, is Ophiomorpha nodosa. Ophiomorpha refers to snake-like form because when these were first named, they looked kind of snake-like. The nodosa part refers to little nodes, and these are fecal pellets, well, not fecal pellets, but pellets that were put on the side of the wall of these burrows. These were actually burrows made by crustaceans, similar to, say, modern ghost shrimp, that it makes this form, Ophiomorpha, and then it has these nodes, nodosa, that I can say to another paleontologist, say, in Poland or Czech Republic or China, I can say Ophiomorpha nodosa. 
I just communicated what that trace fossil is, what it looks like, without going into, yeah, it's kind of snake-like, and it branches, and it has little nodes. That would get lost in translation pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Ophiomorpha is one of my favorite trace fossils. <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> it's a gorgeous trace fossil. That brings up a question that I've had as a museum professional. So a lot of my work recently has been database management and the taxonomy of ICNO fossils is a very hard thing to reconcile. And the way that databases are kind of structured are in like a hierarchical model so similar to Linnaean taxonomy so I have essentially a tree that's my taxonomy tree and I have bins that I can bin the different types of animals into uh, but I've kind of just put ichno fossils as a phyla and I've been like th that's <laughs> what I've seen done in other databases but do you have advice for people who have this problem like me uh, yeah short answer no <laughs> 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 and it's funny because I've been sometimes uh, labeled by my ichnological colleagues as a as a hyper lumper that <laughs> in paleontology we have lumpers and splitters and this is very useful because these of course there are people in between I guess that would make them splitters hmm. okay <laughs> but uh, yeah with with the people in between, they say, well, sometimes we need to lump in these different names that we've given to what's really the same fossil. The splitters say, no, we actually need to have a lot of different names. I'm more of a lumper in that, does this trace fossil show these three or four characteristics? Then, okay, let's call it that ichno genus. Ichno species, then I start going, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't necessarily want to do ichno species. But I understand if some of my colleagues, again, for communication purposes, start classifying them differently. For your purposes, for putting them into a database in a museum collection, it's probably best to at least do the ichno genus if you can. That at least narrows it down. Then I would hand it over to the experts who know more about how do you split it from there for that ichnogenus. So for instance, Ophiomorpha is an ichnogenus. Under that, you can have, gosh, I think I've seen four or five ichnospecies. And I'm only gonna name Nidosa because then people get in arguments after that. <laughs> Does that okay. kind of make sense? Yeah, I'm having more of a problem with everything in between. So I have a phyla or phylum, and then I have ichnogenera and whatever is underneath them. But yeah, the, yeah. the in between so, is just empty. Yeah, so for example, I have a cast of a dinosaur track here that I'm going to hold it up next to my head. And it's uh, when I, I bought it, it's an epoxy resin cast. That was taken from a real dinosaur track. There, you get to see some of the three dimensions of it. I think it, it was labeled as late Triassic and it was Goralitur. So Goralitur is the ichnogenus we give to that dinosaur track. Then the people who study dinosaur tracks, they can communicate with one another by saying Goralitur. They have ichnospecies under that. Now me, I see that and I go, oh, that's a theropod track. And I might write down Gralitor, question mark, <laughs> and then leave that up to the experts in classifying it further. Theropod is an interpretation. So then I'm interpreting this dinosaur track. I'm interpreting this as a dinosaur track. Leaving open that it could have been made by another animal though. That's a hypothesis. But the name we give is based on the form, the form of the track. And that leaves it open for the possibility that something other than a theropod dinosaur made it. How's that for an explanation? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> so do you want to move on to talking about your, your book and your science communication? I'm excited I would to hear love to. Yeah. So Perfect. I've been... Oh, since 2013, I started writing books. I'd written a few books before then, 
But 2013 is when I published this big, thick book called Life Traces of the Georgia Coast. It's more of an academic e book, but I wrote it for general audience too, for people who are naturalists, interested in when they go down to the Georgia coast and they're on the barrier islands, they see burrows, they see tracks or other traces and they go, hmm, I wonder what that is. So it was a book to answer those questions, but also something that my academic friends in paleontology could use. It was published by Indiana University Press uh, and part of their Life of the Past series. Fantastic series of paleontology books that IU Press puts out. So I was really proud to do that. Then I started following that up. 2014, I did uh, Dinosaurs Without Bones. Here's the paperback version right here. That beautiful cover, by the way, uh, the cover art is by paleo artist uh, Peter Tressler. He's an Australian paleo artist, so you should look up his work. That was about the concept of what if every dinosaur skeleton disappeared tomorrow? Every dinosaur bone vanishes. How would we know dinosaurs even existed? And I was like, well, fortunately, we have trace fossils. So the book is about that. And I wrote that overtly for a popular audience. It's a trade book, but has a lot of references in the back for my, again, for my academic friends, if they wanted to learn more from that. I followed that up in 2017 with The Evolution Underground. And the subtitle is Burrows, Bunkers, and the Marvelous Subterranean World Beneath Our Feet. The subtitle should have been How Burrows Changed the World, but Malcolm Gladwell probably would have sued me. Uh, with that, I want you to think about how burrows helped animals survive, especially mass extinctions, and then how burrows changed the world in marine environments, terrestrial environments, all environments, and actually changed everything. It's kind of a big picture book. <laughs> That was a fun one to write. Now, my newest one is Tracking the Golden Isles. And this is, again, a trade book meant for a general audience. It's more about a specific place. So the subtitle you see is The Natural and Human Histories of the Georgia Coast. So it's returning to the Georgia Coast, but I wanted to give more of a view for people who live here in Georgia, as well as outside of Georgia, of how traces give us stories that there are stories written in the sands, in the muds, in the bones, in the, in the driftwood that we see that tell us what happened in this place, and then give us insights on how humans and uh, other organisms have interacted with those places through time. So this is part of my ichnoevangelism. I wanna teach people about traces and why traces matter. Perfect. So a follow-up question to that is, you're a scientist and you're trained as such, just like Jen and I are. You went through grad school and learned how to do science writing. We published these journal papers. How did you transition and teach yourself how to write for a scientific audience, um, or transition from writing for a scientific audience to a more general public audience? Was that something you practiced over the years? Does it, is it self-taught? Because it's a, it's a hard skill to learn. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. It's a hard skill to learn. And in the case of people who are trained to write academically, there's some unlearning to do too. <laughs> that uh, we are oftentimes rewarded with our scientific writing to be as technical as possible, to use a lot of jargon. So there was, in my writing process, I had to unlearn. This is where I thank my students, because for years at Emory, I taught non-science majors, I, and I still do sometimes. But non-science majors, I had to strip out the jargon in my teaching. So there was part of that training, I think, in the classroom of being able to clearly communicate different scientific concepts, particularly in geology and paleontology, that would translate well to people who were not specialists. Then if you can do that on the page, if you can write on the page, then that helps too. Mm -hmm. Here's where I credit blogging. 
So I started blogging in the late 2000s. That was writing I did then through practice for a general audience. That's also how I got more of a, what we call in writing an author voice, that I started finding my voice as an author in a distinctive style. I didn't want to be, say, like Stephen Jay Gould or Pat Shipman or Adrian Mayer, some of these other writers who I really admire, that I read their writing and I go, oh, I love their writing. I'm going to write exactly like them. <laughs> I need to find my own voice. I think after about four or five books, I have found that voice. But it came through teaching first and then blogging and writing, getting really getting into a daily practice of writing. However small, 250 to 500 words a day, that's my typical book writing regime, is that I try to do a little bit every day. And then when you do the math, it adds up. Next thing you know, over the course of a year, year and a half, you have a book. And that's where the editing comes in. <laughs> that's part of the process too. So can you tell us a little bit about the editing process? Because Jen and I, you know, we blog and that's what Time Scavengers is mainly, we have a lot of blogs, um, but we've never written anything as substantial as a book. And we know that the peer review process and editing process for a paper is much different from a book. But can you kind of walk us through that process? Like what, what is that? How long does it take? Yeah, in writing a book, for especially for general audience, I oftentimes, I will write it first uh, and without criticism, self-criticism. So I have to put uh, duct tape over my mouth, <laughs> silence my inner critic, and just, you know, the gif of uh, Jim Carrey doing that. Okay, so I do that. <laughs> I just type, I put down the words, and then set it aside. Later, I'll come back to it, and then I'll go through it and edit it. Sometimes along the way, I'll self-edit. But usually, I just set it aside, come back to it and then go through and edit. Um, my favorite way to edit for a trade book is actually I'll print it. I know, poor trees, but I, I do recycle. I'll print it and then I'll hand edit. That's actually my favorite way to edit. Uh, and my most recent book, Tracking the Golden Isles, I was so grateful that University of Georgia Press actually did send me a printed copy of the uh, page proofs and I went through and I hand edited through those page proofs. Uh, so the editing process is multi-layered, it's multi-stepped. Once I've gone through it in a way that I think it's pretty good, I'm not embarrassed, then I'll hand it over say to a copy editor uh, or other peer reviewers. And actually my last four books have been peer reviewed as well where I've had other experts read the book, look for factual content, as well as how well does it read? Does it read, does it read okay? Um, the Evolution Underground, for instance, I think the peer reviewers I had on that were Sally Walker, Dr. Sally Walker and Dr. Uh, Patricia Kelly, that they were really good peer editors, being, being able to look at it in terms of content, but also did it make sense? Uh, and they also are, are fantastic teachers, so I really trust their, their instincts on, did this sound good enough that a, uh, someone who's not an expert will get what I'm writing about? That's awesome. Do you also get during this process, do you have other friends that are non-scientists read the book? And oh, yeah, go through it yeah. absolutely. And I'm really glad you mentioned that because uh, Life Traces of the Georgia Coast the people who actually heard that book first were non-scientists. I was in a small writing group at Emory um, and there were just three of us. One of them, you've probably heard of her, she's famous, <laughs> Isabel Wilkerson. She wrote this uh, absolutely fantastic book that should be required reading of every American. It's called The Warmth of Other Suns. It's about the great migration of African Americans from the South to the North. And she tells it through three different people. She was in our writing group and she's a Pulitzer Prize winner who <laughs> is writing this 
award-winning book. And the other member of our group, Christine Restano, she was writing a book that was about uh, more personal, more about uh, personal traumas that she had had happen in her life. Three very different books, three very different people. We got together once every two weeks or so over the course of two years, we read our writing to one another, which I now do in my classes. When I teach my students writing, I have them do that as an exercise, read it out loud to one another. When you read it out loud as an editing process and that person reading your work out loud, that's right, hand it to the other person, they read your work out loud and they're not an expert in your field they're gonna find where you're unclear. <laughs> they're gonna stumble over your words. They're gonna go, what, what, Ophio what? <laughs> and they're gonna help you find how to make it better. So I am forever grateful to Isabel and Christine for being in this group with me where they really taught me to be more clear with my writing for people who are not experts in my field. Yeah, yeah thanks for asking that. That's <laughs> Yeah, of course. Well, with Time Scavengers, we have an editor and she is not trained as a geoscientist. And you know, her feedback for us is invaluable too. And that's, you know, we owe her a lot too for saying Absolutely. Hey, yes. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's it's so <laughs> such a critical part of science communication that I think a lot of scientists don't realize is getting outside of your science circle, get in touch with your friends and hand them something and say, does this make sense? And I've even had my mom email me and say, I don't know what you're talking about in this blog. Fix it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, isn't that perfect? I love yeah, it. <laughs> even, even if your mother has a PhD in some other science, she might read your blog and go, oh, I didn't quite get that. <laughs> so yeah. that, that really helps when you have somebody from outside of your field helping you. And especially the non-scientists, people who may be experts in whatever field, political science or sociology, if they can read your blog and go, oh yeah, I get it, then that's a high compliment. It means that you're, you're using a minimum of jargon and you're using it in an engaging way, hopefully with a good narrative structure too, that people are following a story along the way. Exactly. And you touched on something that I think is really important too when we're doing science communication is storytelling. When you're writing your book, do you keep this in mind that you want to write it as a story? Or are you trying to bring people in and then bring them along in a journey with you? Do you think that's the most effective way to do this? Yes, I do. And uh, there's a class I teach at Emory that uh, I'm going to be teaching it every spring. I've taught it three times now called environmental science communication. In that, I work with them on narrative structure, making sure they have some sort of narrative structure. Now, what's that? The very simple way to do this is how uh, Randy Olson, science communicator, has written several books on this. Uh, he uses, uh, he calls it the ABT, the and, but, therefore framework. So that's something I work with the students and we experiment with it. We, we test it throughout the entire semester. We're good scientists. <laughs> while we're doing our communicating. And this and but therefore is that we give information. So I was following these tracks. They were in the sidewalk, preserved in the cement. But I'm not sure what animal made them. Suddenly, I've created some dynamic tension in that story. But I don't know what made them. Now there's a mystery afoot. Ah. <laughs> Therefore, I need to come to some conclusion toward the end to resolve that. I can't just leave the audience hanging. There has to be some way then to carry on that narrative. So the end, but therefore, as a framework, works really well then for me to hang my stories, that I make sure that when I'm writing that, and oftentimes I start the chapters in my books with a, with a little story typically told in the field, that structure helps me, keeps me on track, pun intended, to keep the narrative structure so that the reader is going to be engaged and interested. 
the deadliest mistake we make <laughs> is when we do the end, end, end. And then I looked at the tracks, and then I saw it had four toes, and then I saw it had claw marks, and then I looked at the heel. Oh my gosh, you, you are snoring already. Just stop, kill me. <laughs> you wanna make sure that you have some sort of structure in there, and you're not doing the information overload. <laughs> That is excellent advice and so true. So just to finish wrapping up talking about your book, where can people find your book if they wanted to go and read these and buy them? Are they available oh, online? I'm, I'm so glad you asked that. So tracking the Golden Isles, what's great right now, go to the University of Georgia Press website. They have a coupon code there. Mm. You can get 50% off. Can't find a better deal. <laughs> so do that. Yeah, don't don't buy it through that thing, you know, that that entity. Instead, go save yourself 50%. Go to the University of Georgia website, uh, press website, UGA press.org. Go there, the coupon code is there, look it up, use the coupon code. And that's good until the end of June. They did it in May, they're gonna do it in June. Now my other books, you can get those, look for those through, there's a website, indiebound.org, I-N-D-I-E, indiebound.org, that you can look up your nearest independent bookstore. Because right now with the pandemic still going on, independent bookstores are having a really tough time. And I love independent bookstores. So what you can do is, uh, I think you can just put in your zip code and that will tell you the nearest independent bookstore order the books then through those bookstores. Now what's great is, is now uh, the Evolution Underground is available in paperback, so you can save some money there. And then uh, same with Dinosaurs Without Bones, also in paperback, so you can save money there. Uh, and then some people prefer either on Kindle or Nook or other e-readers, you can get your e-version as well. And occasionally there are good sales on those. So wait for the sales too. Because I want people to save save money for you know important things like pizza and beer. Very important things. I'm <laughs> sure they're also available through like public libraries. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I'm always happy when somebody says, Hey, look what I found in my library, and they post a picture on Twitter. I'm like, thank you. I love hearing that libraries have my books too. So if your library, your public library, does not have my books, then please persuade them to get them. <laughs> but do it quietly. You don't want to get shushed. <laughs> <laughs> so we have three more questions we were gonna ask, just getting into more of like the technology side of things and traces and tracks. Um, so the other question we have for you along the lines of technology is that sometimes traces are found within or around other fossils that can tell us a compelling story from a snapshot in time. Can you tell us about one such trace fossil? Yeah, one that comes to mind is I was working with a group from Indiana University, Fort Wayne, as Jim Farlow was in charge of the group. They were studying dinosaur tracks uh, in Dinosaur Valley State Park outside of Glen Rose, Texas. It's a world famous track site. I was there as more of the invertebrate ichnologist, where I was looking at the invertebrate burrows that were associated with the dinosaur tracks. So there were these uh, U-shaped burrows that we give them the ichnogenus name uh, Diplocriterion. It's a mouthful, but people who know it, they know what it is. Those were associated with some of the horizons below where the dinosaur tracks were. But there was one place where a dinosaur actually stepped on one of the burrows. So this brings in the question, did that dinosaur step on the burrow while there was a little, say, crustacean inside the burrow? And I think the answer is no. The reason being it looked like the burrow was barely compressed. And this was a big theropod dinosaur that stepped on it. It probably weighed at least a ton. Should have compressed it more if it had been muddy, if it had been squishy. This tells me that invertebrate burrow with the dinosaur track tells me something about, ah, that burrow was probably long abandoned. 
its maker was probably dead, maybe for decades. Then it was buried, then it was emerged, and this dinosaur stepped on it while it was a firm ground, while it was firm and not muddy. This is a way you can tell sometimes the gap in time between trace fossils, that despite their being together, doesn't mean they were there at the same time. This also gets you to think about how these gaps in time, trace fossils are sometimes valuable for us to be able to figure those out. Another example I'll give you is, again, using dinosaurs, is thinking about dinosaur bones. And I write about this in Dinosaurs Without Bones. That I cheat a little bit. I do talk about dinosaur bones in it. But <laughs> there are bones that have tooth marks in them, tooth traces, where another dinosaur chomped on the dinosaur. So I think uh, Stephanie Drumheller and Julia McHugh, for instance, published a paper recently about this with allosaur tooth marks. Those tooth traces then tell us that the dinosaur who was being eaten had to have been dead. Because to get through all that meat to get down to the bone, it wasn't just sitting there saying, yeah, okay, you got down to my bone. It was dead. <laughs> so this tells us again a little bit about the gap in time between when did a dinosaur eat another dinosaur, but also what dinosaur ate another dinosaur. These are ways that you can take trace fossils, put them together with other fossils, and be able to figure out some of the relationships between these different organisms at sometimes at different times. How's that? That's really cool. Yeah, it is. I think that is also really cool because Adrian and I used to collect Diplocriterion in the Ordovician. Um, and you're talking about a much younger example. So just thinking about the same shape, burrow, maybe different trace makers, maybe very different trace makers, given hundreds of millions of years in between. Uh, but that's, that's a really cool thing, I think, about technology that is maybe lost a little bit on people. Thank you for mentioning that, because I actually got my start as a paleontologist in the Ordovician. I did my master's thesis work in the uh, in the Cincinnati region. I, I went to Miami. All, all of us did. That's awesome. <laughs> the real Miami, as I like to tell people. <laughs> Miami was a university before Florida was a state. They had the t-shirts there. Uh, but what was great were the trace fossils there. A lot of those trace fossils that I saw then, again, yeah, like you said, you can see some of the same ichnogenera in rocks in much younger, much younger rocks, geologically speaking. The Ordovician, more than 400 million years ago. And then the ones I was talking about from Glen Rose, those are a mere 95 million. <laughs> yeah, those are baby traces <laughs> so, yeah. compared to the Ordovician. So yeah, that's pretty cool that we can look at these trace fossils then and we can think about the very different animals that would have made those very similar looking trace fossils, maybe representing the same behaviors and behaviors that are repeating through time. Awesome. I have kind of a wild card question. So I remember taking ichnology uh, with Dan Hembry at Ohio University, and we got on the topic of eggs. And are eggs trace fossils? Because technically there's some sort of biomineral, but technically they're not a hard part of an animal. What are your feelings on this? Oh, I, I don't just have feelings about it. <laughs> I have certainty. <laughs> okay. Oh. Eggs are body fossils. They're body parts. This is one of my favorite quiz questions, test questions for my students. So any Emory students who are gonna be taking my classes, you're learning this now. Any who have taken my classes, they've already learned this. Eggs are body parts because it's an extra body part for the developing embryo. So okay. the eggshell itself, it's like an extra body part. Same with, a, uh, same with a pupa, for instance. And because you had classes from Dr. Hembry, he's into insect traces. So a pupa, pupal case is a body part of that insect, of that, of that insect as it's developing. 
a cocoon that's preserved as a fossil that shows the actual silk weave. That's a trace fossil. Okay. Yeah. So eggs, what's also cool though, is that there are trace fossils of hatching windows of where a little baby dinosaur poked its head out of the egg. That hatching window, that's a trace fossil. Mm. If you had an egg mm. that a dinosaur stepped on it, that would be a trace fossil of the dinosaur stepping on the egg. <laughs> if you had uh, um, the old stereotype of a mammal eating the egg, if you had those tooth traces mm. in the eggshell, that would be a trace fossil, but of the mammal. So you can have trace fossils in the eggs themselves, but the egg, eggshell, that's a trace fossil. Well, I learned something new. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Now, just to complicate it even more though, if uh, the troodon, which was a theropod dinosaur in uh, the late Cretaceous, about 75 million years ago, its eggs are paired. So it actually had the eggs paired, which has been hypothesized as indicating it had dual oviducts. They are also long eggs that are oriented vertically that were probably partially buried by the mother and or father dinosaurs in the nest. That orientation and the duality of those eggs, those are trace fossils but the eggs are body fossils. Mm -hmm. See, we could do an entire exam on this, <laughs> but I won't. I figured you would have an opinion on it. So I, yes. <laughs> I just remember that very much from class, like this is debated, heated arguments. Oh, you could go <laughs> on and on with it. It's fun. <laughs> really cool stuff. So getting back to Georgia specifically, because you live there, you write a lot about it. What can Ignology tell us about Georgia's future specifically? Yeah, the Georgia coast, I write about this in, in Tracking the Golden Isles. In the last couple of chapters, fact, chapters, I talk about sea level change and how sea level change and especially storms, we're going to have increasing numbers of storms. We've had two hurricanes hit the Georgia coast uh, recently, uh, Matthew and Irma. Those are gonna change those environments very quickly, literally overnight. What happens then is that's new real estate that the trace makers come in and they start occupying that real estate right away. So for instance, there's a, a salt marsh on Sapelo Island that over the past 10 years, I have watched it disappear and it's gone. The last time I was down there in uh, February, it was gone. It is now under several sheets of sand. So this salt marsh that had fiddler crabs leaving their little burrows in it, that had uh, mussels attaching to the surface, that had root traces from smooth cord grass, those traces now have been replaced by a layer of sand that has fiddler crabs, sand fiddler crabs, and ghost crabs, and now insects that are burrowing in the top of that. These traces give us a prediction, a prediction of what's going to happen with climate change on the Georgia coast as sea level goes up, but also storms, that storms are going to go over the pre-existing environments. And we're getting what geology, in geology we call Walther's Law, happening in real time. We're actually watching these laterally adjacent environments go over one another vertically. And we're seeing this happen over the course of just in a few years, we can watch it. This is where traces give us a prediction. We can say that this environment is gonna change into this environment and these are what animals and plants are going to be moving into that new neighborhood once that change takes place. So yeah. relatedly then, this can probably be extrapolated to other states along the Eastern coast of the US, right? because we're all kind of part of the same, you know, in North Carolina, we have the Outer Banks, these barrier island systems. Um, so what can technology tell us then about the more global implications of anthropogenic driven climate change? Yeah, this is, this is a really good question because I like to point to the East Coast of the United States and particularly its barrier islands. 
as being kind of canaries in the coal mine. We have on the east coast of the United States, going from Florida all the way up to Maine, we have barrier islands that people have modified a lot of them, but then there are a good number that have not been modified so much. The Georgia coast has some of the best examples of that, of barrier islands that have not been modified so much by, by humans. What we can do is look at those as canaries in the coal mine and think about how as climate change starts impacting those environments, how do traces inform us about those changes all the way up the East Coast? Now, globally, globally, a lot of geologists, sedimentary geologists study the barrier islands of the Eastern US as examples that then they apply worldwide. So of course, barrier islands vary worldwide, but the East Coast ones are often a model for what we see worldwide with coastlines and how coastlines are changing, especially because of human interactions with those coastlines. Traces, I think, are another tool that we can put in our toolbox, that we can use traces and technology to better understand these changes as we go into this uncertain future with storms, greater storms, uh, fiercer storms, and then sea level rise. What's going to happen? Traces are an yet another tool in our Swiss army knife of tools that we use to predict how the, how the present is going to tell us something about the future. I think it's also important to mention, um, we've been talking a lot about how we think about like different groups of traces being in certain areas, um, there's a lot of uh, like seminal work that really explained things like oxygen content, the type of substrate, and why you expect to see these different types of traces in these assemblages. So some things do better in high energy. Some animals do not like high energy and need something a little bit away from the coastline to kind of really thrive and establish their burrows. Uh, but maybe uh, Adrian and I can include some links and maybe you have some links you could send us so we can include them in a little document for people who are interested in kind of diving more into getting a better understanding of these assemblages because they are very valuable. I agree completely and I'm really glad you're going to do that because one of the uh, I think one of the applications of paleontology that we're seeing today with climate change and thinking about how climate change fits in with paleontology is this whole field of conservation paleobiology. And both of you have, have expertise in this, and then we have lots of other paleontologists who are working in this discipline, now working with biologists and conservation biologists in particular, for how can we, how can we use our knowledge of the past to better inform ourselves about what to do in the future, particularly with conservation biology in preventing extinctions and those kinds of those kind of measures that we we need to act now on it and we're here to help so great idea i'm i'm looking forward to helping with that i have sort of a a question i think uh our followers would be interested in so you're a faculty member who teaches does research and you're also an author but there are other jobs for ichnologists if people are interested in study, studying trace fossils. Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, traditionally with ichnology, a lot of the ichnologists have been employed in the, uh, well, in the energy industry, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they used to say petroleum, but then it became petroleum, natural gas, and all of the fossil fuels. As that is waning, as we are seeing this transition now from a fossil fuel intensive economy as we're going into alternative fuels and the future is happening now in that, it's not necessarily those technologists are gonna be out of a job. <laughs> so what I just said is our working with, with conservation biologists, I see that as part of the future of more traditionally trained, uh, trained technologists. However, I would also like to point out that there's a whole discipline of conservation biology of people who work with tracks and they work with tracks of say endangered animals or doing surveys of animals in protected ecosystems. I think this is something where we ecologists can also contribute to the people who are out there tracking animals 
taking data, uh, GIS data, say through Cyber Tracker or other GIS mapping. I think this is something where we can contribute to, that we can work together with conservation biologists and better see, I guess what you would say is the unseen biota, the, the animals you don't go out and just witness every day, traces add an extra dimension and really expand your, your worldview of what lives in a given place. Does yeah, that help? That's, yeah, that's it's, an excellent answer. Gives, yeah, and it gives hope for those, those people who love technology now that yes, you will get a job somehow. <laughs> Yeah, You're not I, useless. <laughs> I was remembering in ecology class, I, I don't think we focused on cores, but I remember Dan brought out some cores and I was like, oh boy, like trying to <laughs> look at the like, just oh the side God. and like the little squiggles. But like that is also like, that is a challenging puzzle to to try and do if you're interested in really examining these minutia of bioturbation long ago and these core sediments. Here's what's really great though about if you're all trained as geologists and a lot of ecologists are trained as geologists is we really get these basic principles though, like cross-cutting relations. Once you have that little Steno principle, you can apply it with trace fossils where with cores you can say, this burrow is cutting across this burrow, this burrow is cutting across this one, and you can work out the sequence. <laughs> and then you can see where it goes from a soft ground to a firm ground to a hard ground. You can work out that time sequence, relatively speaking. This is where we, being trained as geologists, we really have a, I won't say an unfair advantage, but I'll just say, yeah, we're pretty darn cool. <laughs> <laughs> that we we actually have those skills that we can apply in universal ways. And that's so neat that you mentioned cores and that came up and you can see these three relationships within the core. So I also sailed with the International Ocean Discovery Program and we sailed in 2017 to the Tasman Sea. And when we were coring there, we brought up this core and they had, and I think the sediments were of a Ligocene or Eocene age, beautiful zoophycus in them and a lot of them were puritized. And it was, uh, and going back to what you talked about, like certain traces mean certain things. And I was like, ah, I'll bet this means it was really deep, you know, deep water, maybe low oxygen, maybe low nutrients, if I'm remembering correctly from our technology class years ago. I got really excited over that. And I don't know if other people did, but. I'm yeah. excited now. <laughs> yeah. I think I have, hold on. I might have that puritized zoophagus in my desk. Hold on. <sighs> <laughs> can it get any more thrilling? <laughs> <laughs> it can, actually. So Alicia used to do these dances, and I'm pretty sure she has a Zophicus dance. Am I wrong? I think, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure she would go <laughs> like this, and she, like this is supposed to be like simulating the feeding, and she would turn around in circles oh, we need to get... <laughs> and dance in front of her classroom. <laughs> And I'm by sure Alicia, you mean Dr. Stigall. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. I think we need to get video and, and then <laughs> we need to post that sometime. <laughs> Hi, class. I know we're not together, but I always have a particular dance that I do to explain the difference between zoophycus and chondrites. Both of these are traces produced by worms that are moving through the sediment and eating food. So here's how it works. In a zoophycus, the worm moves into the sediment like this, eating food as it goes along. And then it comes back out and it kind of sweeps around. So it goes in and out and it spirals like this. I'm sorry, my kids are laughing, but this is how it works. So it spirals, it goes in and out and in and out. Now, the difference with the chondrites is that it is also a worm that is moving into the sediment and is doing deposit feeding. But the way that it moves is it goes in and it comes out a little bit and then to the side, mid. The sediment doop 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 doop. Then it moves sideways. Doop 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 doop. <laughs> moves sideways. Doop 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 doop. So that's the difference between sweeping in a zoophagus and then spreading in and out in a chondrites. Yeah, she has one for lophophores, zoophagus, and I am sure I'm missing a couple. Yeah, yeah. So this is something I do in my classes is I will sometimes imitate trace making behavior. So I'm really glad to hear Dr. <laughs> it's not Stigall just you. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not just me. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, I can't find that periodized euphagus, but it is really neat. Oh, I wish I had it. I well, thought... if you find it, get a picture of it, and we can pop it in. Oh, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have. Yeah, and what's those. yeah, and what's neat is you mentioned the pyrite. I got really excited about that because pyrite. People who don't even know paleontology or ecnology, they know about pyrite. It's fool's gold. That really tiny pyrite that they call framboidal pyrite, that is facilitated by uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria. So there's a story there. You have these anaerobic bacteria that are facilitating the reaction of iron and sulfur, causing those to react in that pyrite. Then this is kind of a trace of the bacterial behavior, if you want to call that interacting with the organic substrates made by the zoophycos making animal. And absolutely, yes, it tells you something about what was happening with the oxygen levels on the seafloor. That's why I got so excited when you said that. <laughs> yeah, it was really great when we pulled up those cores and sliced them open and they were on the table and I went, oh my gosh, look at all these zoophycos. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was great fun. I'm so glad you shared that. <laughs> I'm just sorry, I wish I had thought about getting that specimen earlier. I'll keep looking for it and I can put a picture in. That's okay. I don't think we had anticipated coming to cores in this conversation. It just happened. It did. It was you never know. It's kind of like, I don't know, uh, meandering trace fossils. Sometimes it just meanders all over the place and you never know <laughs> where it's going. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, Tony, that's all the questions we had for you. We've been going for about an hour. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we wanted, that you wanted to cover that we didn't cover? Jen, was there yeah, anything? Yeah, I, I guess as a, just an inspirational message for everybody is that traces are everywhere. Traces are everywhere. And even in quarantine conditions, you can go out and you can find traces. So this morning I went out for a little walk. I am in in my neighborhood here in Decatur, Georgia, next to Atlanta, just walking through my neighborhood. And I, I took pictures of uh, dog tracks and cement, cat tracks and cement. I even found what I'm pretty sure are morning dove tracks mm -hmm. that were left in cement that I was doing field work this morning. <laughs> and it felt like paleontology, it felt like ecnology. But if you want modern traces, you can go to your local park, look at ant nests, look at some of the bee nests that were uh, just a month ago, there were bee nests, ground nesting bees that were in the park next door. Traces are everywhere. Once you start looking, you'll find them. So if you're, if you're quarantining and you're like, oh, I'm so bored, go out, you'll find some traces, you'll get excited. They're everywhere, just look for them. And it would be cool, oh, sorry. I was gonna say it would be cool to think about every trace fossil like my cats could make. Do they make similar trace fossils or different trace fossils? And what behaviors are represented with like the suite of what remains? Yeah, yeah. I've thought about doing a book like The Ecnology of Cats. It would have a catchier <laughs> title. <laughs> but we have two cats here at home and uh, yeah, that's, that's a book that would write itself pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I have a question. Thinking about modern traces, I had this weird question. Are m mosquito bites or bug bites on us? Are those traces? Ooh, yeah. So, yeah, here's the thing. If you have a wound, okay, so a wound, it is a trace temporarily of that mosquito's behavior or parasitic dipterins in general. So it's a trace of its behavior, however temporary. But then if it heals, if you don't see it, well, then it's not preserving. Now, if you had some sort of scar, like if you had a good, a good bite from something or a pinch from, uh, oh, I don't know, one of those shell crushing crabs, ooh, I wouldn't want that. If it left an actual scar, then that's a trace that, that lasts. So then it, it really does depend on, is the substrate conducive to preserving that trace? In my book, Dinosaurs Without Bones, I actually talk about there's a wound that was in dinosaur skin. I think it was a, a hadrosaur that actually had a wound preserved in that fossil skin. So that's a trace fossil of whatever inflicted that. 
Now, the authors thought maybe it was a tooth trace, but I also allow for the possibility that it stumbled into a thorny plant. In which case, that would be a trace of the hadrosaur being really derpy and clumsy and hoo -hoo -hoo, stumbling into a plant. <laughs> That's not a trace of the plant. So good question and yet another question that I can ask my students to torture them. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, speaking of scars, I've got and cats. I've got some scars on my arm where my cats have bitten, scratched me through the years. So that's cool. Now I can say that those are feeless cats. Oh, traces. That's right. <laughs> we'll see if they make it into the fossil record. I don't know. Doubt it, but we'll see. <laughs> we have a, there are cool fossils of echinoderms. They actually heal. So if something like bites them or like nibbles on something, sometimes you can find find the like trace of that in their skeletons like it was clear that it wasn't a post-mortem because you actually see them trying to patch their, their body back together which is so cool absolutely yeah there are bite traces i've seen them in modern sand dollars on the georgia coast that yes it heals then you see fossil examples there are healed bite traces in uh, trilobites too mm -hmm. um yeah this is actually yeah, I can't reveal it, but the next book I'm going to do is getting more into <laughs> hard substrates and those kind of really cool uh, traces too. Yeah. <laughs> so that's exciting. neat. Yeah, thanks for mentioning echinoderms, which are among the coolest animals yeah. ever, right? Oh, I had to. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Barton, for coming and talking to us today about trace fossils and technology and what they can tell us about the past and the future. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and we hope everyone goes out and looks for traces modern day um, on yourself if you even feel a need to, through <laughs> scars or bites or around ponds and nests. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. You're very welcome. And thank you for asking me to be on Time Scavengers. It's been a pleasure. Thank you everyone for sticking with us to the end of our first interview. Um, this was certainly an interesting learning process, but we had a really great time chatting with Tony. If you have any questions for Tony, Adrian, or myself, please leave them in the comments below and we will do our best to address them. We look forward to sharing more areas and facets of paleontology with you through this interview series.